All right, guys, we are four games into the NFL season, and that means it's approximately time for our quarter season recap. We're going to go through each fantasy position and look at the top performers, analyze how this compares to our pre-draft rankings, what preconceived notions that we were right about, where we were wrong, uh, some of the people that are... Sh should be here but are missing from this list and then what data we can extrapolate from these top performers and see how that is going to pan out for the rest of the season going forward so as always like the video comment down below what you think of your season so far i mean it's been a crazy 2023 nfl season so i'd love to hear some of your reactions down in the comments below subscribe to the channel if you are new here because we still have a long season left to go and i'm gonna go ahead and cue that intro Welcome back in to Twin Takes Fantasy Football for our first season update of the year. We'll go through and we'll do a quarter season recap. We'll do a half season recap. And then finally, we'll end off with a three quarter season recap and maybe a full season recap after week 17, where most fantasy championships have wrapped up with the new NFL schedule, with bye weeks, with the 17 game season over eight weeks. It's hard to pinpoint the exact quarter, half and three quarter marks. But with all teams having played four games thus far, it felt like the the appropriate time to do so so we'll go through the wide receivers then the running backs the quarterbacks and finally the tight ends do we have to go through tight ends Ugh, it's such a irrelevant position for fantasy but we will do it because that's how dedicated we are at this channel and just kind of talk through where we are with each position a quarter of the way through the season um, if i'm missing anything go ahead and leave it down in the comments below any big trends or news stories or headlines. I'll try to recap some of those big headlines that are, aren't encapsulated by this data here uh, when we wrap things up at the end. But if I miss anything, go ahead, put it down in the comments below and I will respond. So without further ado, let's jump into the wide receiver position. And I don't want to be a prisoner of confirmation bias, but when we look at the wide receiver rankings, maybe like just general top 20 it seems that like the fantasy community has gotten it right and it really does kind of confirm my preconceived notions that this is a league and fantasy football is a sport that's transitioning to a wide receiver dominant league where it's more it's much easier to project the top wide receivers and this is why a lot of these wide receivers are going very very um high in drafts this is why 2023 had the most first round wide receivers in the history of fantasy football on average obviously it depends on your league and how people play but if we look across all leagues we saw the highest rate of wide receivers being drafted in the first round the first two rounds and the first three rounds in the history of fantasy football moving away from those workhorse running backs and this such being a uh running back dominated league and that and there could be a plethora of options for that i mean it could be the uptick in people switching from standard scoring to ppr scoring but i also do think you have to credit um, fantasy communities being much more intelligent about the wide receiver position and also the nfl as a league becoming a more pass dominant league so many factors that are wrapped up into this but there's as we look through this top 20 list right here there's not that many surprises justin jefferson he was the 101 consensus yeah yeah we knew that um tyree kill uh, especially after the Cooper Cup injury rose up to the wide receiver three off boards, average draft position was 104 to 105. So him being here at the second position, not a surprise at all. Keenan Allen, you know, a little bit higher, but again, a guy that was going off in the third rounds, a guy that's historically been productive. So not all that surprising to see him up this high. Some of the other, you know, guys that were pretty accurate based on their ADP. Stephon Diggs was either the wide receiver five or six off the board, jumped up a little bit with the Cooper Cup injury news. So at the four, you know, not surprising at all. Devontae Adams was around that wide receiver seven to eight, you know, jumps up a little bit over CD and AJ Brown, but still, you know, he was a top 10 uh, fantasy wide receiver in drafts and he projects that through four weeks of the season and probably for the rest of the season. He's just that talented. AJ Brown, Falls a little bit from his ADP, but, you know, right around where we projected him to be. Amon Ra, I, I love talking about Amon Ra because he's just the picture of consistency. He's never going to be, I mean, he will have those blow-up weeks we've seen last week and week, or last year in week three. He had, you know, the two touchdown, 170-yard game, one for like 37 fantasy points. But this man just is old, reliable, will always have eight to ten targets, will always be somewhere around that seven to eight, eight catch mark. Just, you know, a PPR machine. 
and being a top 10 borderline top 10 wide receiver is always going to be something in his repertoire that I could genuinely see for the next five, six years for Adam Thielen. Devonta Smith was the wide receiver 15 to 16 off of boards, maybe a little bit higher based on your league format, but you know, he considers um, very in line with ADP. Debo Samuel also very in line with his ADP was taken a little bit after Devonta Smith. CD Lamb falls down a little bit, but I don't think this is indicative of him underperforming whatsoever. I think it's indicative of the Cowboys overperforming. They've had three games in which have been massive blowouts um, against the Giants, against the Patriots. Should have been against the Cardinals, but, you know, I guess that's the one outlier Cowboys blow-up game of the season. But, you know, as the games as the season continues, as the Cowboys continue to find themselves in more competitive games, CD, I think, will continue to um, get better. His usage will get up. They just haven't really needed to pass down the field. They've been, you know, every single game, Deuce Vaughn has been the primary back in the fourth quarter, which kind of shows you the game script that the Cowboys have been all season. And they just haven't needed to utilize CD. I don't think this is indicative of him not being talented. It's been more indicative of how dominant the Cowboys defense has been. But, you know, a lot of wonky game scripts to start. So, He will rise up boards as the season uh, progresses. Um, And DK Metcalf, you know, falls a little bit from his ADP. But, you know, still a top 20 wide receiver. Still a very uh, capable wide receiver too, which is probably where you drafted him to be. So, you know... And we just talked about a good over 10 over ten out of the 20 top wide receivers are in line with ADP or where in line with expe- expectations coming into the draft, which shows that we have a very good hit rate on projecting wide receivers, especially uh, in the new age fantasy. And I'm even going to go out on a limb, and this might be confirmation bias. You can go ahead and call out me, you know, hindsight is 2020. But I don't, I don't want to say Puka Nakua is going to be the biggest shock to have him here at wide receiver five. I mean, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. Puka, you know... Rookie wide receiver coming in to Los Angeles Rams, a team projected to be in the bottom five, being top five here at Fantasy through four weeks. Yes, that is absolutely something to take note of. No one, not certainly not myself, is projecting him to be a very fantasy-relevant wide receiver, but we did project Cooper Cup to be a fantasy-relevant wide receiver. He was the third wide receiver off draft boards prior to that hamstring injury, and we knew that as soon as Matt Stafford find, found a wide receiver that he liked, he was going to absolutely pepper them with targets. And Puka Nakua... I mean, if we change this name to Cooper Cup, no one is shocked at all. And Puka has taken that Cooper Cup role. So, I mean, a lot of people were projecting it was going to be Van Jefferson was the guy that was going to step up and take over that Cooper Cup role while he was out dealing with that hamstring injury. It just so happened to be Puka. But it's so cringy, I know. But the process was right. Okay, I'm sorry. That's the only time I will say that. I felt felt disgusting saying that. Um, But yeah, if we look at kind of all the background information that goes into why Puka was the is the wide receiver five through four weeks it, it was right in front of our faces and and apparently Puka's part of the breakfast club with Matthew Stafford I mean that was a clear indication of before Cooper Cup's uh, wide receiver triple crown season so I mean if we were just more attentive to the narrative aspect of fantasy football and the break paid attention to the breakfast club uh, Molly Ringwald would have called up and said you know you should have drafted Puka in the first round um, but we'll have to see how that pans out uh, week five we're supposed to see Cooper Cup come off the IR back at practice I don't know if he'll be playing or starting uh, for the Rams given his injury status there hasn't been too much information floated around about Cooper Cup's hamstring and the recovery process thus far um, but when Cooper Cup comes back, we'll have to see how that impacts both Puka and Tutu Atwell. Um, some of the biggest surprises that, you know, even if we want to look into the narrative aspect of these players are still massive surprises. Nico Collins being here at the wide receiver seven. Um, I mean, definitely a guy that people were taking flyers on later on in the draft. You know, there's going to have to be someone that stepped up in that Houston wide receiver room, even for the most abysmal fantasy teams. Well, maybe not Tennessee Titans, but even for the most abysmal fantasy teams, you see one skill position player really emerge, really come out as a fantasy relevant asset. Um, And with how putrid that offensive line has been doing Damian Pierce, absolutely zero favors. And with, Uh, CJ Stroud's meteoric rise and adaptation to the NFL game. The wide receiver that has come out as his main go-to target is Nico Collins. And I think we're going to be talking about CJ Stroud a little bit later on uh, here when we get down to the quarterback position as a guy that's been a major riser. Um, But when you find that alpha wide receiver that continues to produce week in and week out, especially attached to a guy that is top five in passing yardage through week four, um, obviously going to be a very fantasy relevant asset. And Nico Collins, I'd 
I am expecting him to continue, maybe not to produce at this high of a level, but certainly be around the Amon Ra, Brandon Ayuk um, level of production for the fantasy season going forward. I think he's a guy that if you're able to buy in on him early in the season, you'll be very happy with what you got. Adam Thielen, I think, you know, this rankings, and we'll talk about rankings that I think are inflated based off of um, extraneous data off of one outlier game. And we have to address that outlier game because I mean, a sample size of four is still indicative of certain trends throughout the fantasy football season, but they're still, it's still a small enough sample size where one outlier can really throw things off. And I think without Adam Thielen, we had that one really big game for him when Andy Dalton came in and stepped in as the backup quarterback for week three. And I think that really inflated artificially inflated his value more than he's actually worth. I don't think he's going to be a wide receiver one for the rest of the season, let alone a wide receiver two. I think he's a, um, he's established himself as the go-to guy in the Panthers offense when it comes to the wide receiver position. We still want to see some of that progression from Bryce Young, but overall, Adam Thielen is a, probably a good flex option going forward, but you know, definitely returned on the value of the ADP you drafted him at. Brandon Ayuk, I know a lot of people were very high on him having this breakout season. We know that the 49ers are going to be this dominant offense, and you know, he's Definitely been a recipient of that. When he can stay healthy, of course. Uh, and what's even more impressive is he's only played three weeks thus far, and he still ranks in as a wide receiver 12. I think those of you who are projecting the breakout, you know, you you read into the data, you read into the offseason narratives, his utilization and training camp, and you were right. Brandon Ute came out, and he's been absolutely amazing. He's been doing this without actually having a disparity in touchdowns. He's been able to generate a lot of his production through – true pass work, which is really, really indicative of him not being an outlier. I mean, if he had been getting two touchdowns each and every week, then I'm like, let's guys, the touchdown, it's not a sticky stat, but you know, we see him putting up hundred yard games week in and week out. And that is a stat that's indicative of performance rest of the season, especially with Debo already dealing with injuries. I'm very confident with Brandon Ayuk being a wide receiver 12 for the rest of the season. Um, Romeo Dobbs, we'll see how this uh, production goes and, continues for the rest of the season. Obviously, Christian Watson missed the most of the first month of the NFL season with hamstring issues and also AJ Brown, or sorry, Aaron Jones, not AJ Dillon, wild, wild missed talk there. But with um, Aaron Jones and both Christian Watson out, I think Romeo Dobbs value got boosted. This is probably, again, a guy that I love as a flex option. I think he will be heavily utilized as a second year wide receiver. He does get that, you know, sophomore wide receiver breakout bump. And I do think he's very talented, but, you know, as a high end wide receiver too, maybe you're going to want to cool your jets on that for the rest of the season. And Marquise Brown, definitely a guy that you know, I was highlighting prior to the draft. Um, listen, I was high on him. I might, I did definitely rescind some of my takes when I first, when I figured out Josh Dobbs would be the quarterback, but Josh Dobbs has seriously outperformed everyone's expectations. And that's not a generalization or an exaggeration. Not a, if you find a person that told me that Josh Dobbs is going to be this good through the first month of the season, I'll show you a liar because no one knew Josh Dobbs is going to be this effective uh, at commanding the Cardinals offense. And obviously um, kind of in the same boat as a Nico Collins, when you have such a pass funnel offense that does that, they got rid of Deandre Hopkins. It's just Marquise Brown. Michael Wilson has been a very a big bright spot on the other side of the field. And obviously as long as he can stay healthy, the rookie wide receiver out of Stanford has been pretty impactful, but Marquise Brown, um, is a guy that's been talented. He's put up thousand yards receiving seasons before with the Baltimore Ravens and a guy that's talent should not be ignored. And if he, and you know, if this continues to progress, you know, the Cardinals look like a team that's going to be competitive going forward. And Marquise Brown, you know, was a guy that I thought was in addition to James Conner, the Arizona Cardinals were assets that were undervalued based off of negative preconceived notions around the team, you know, with them actually putting up a competent offense and not being completely incompetent. Marquise Brown returns some fantasy value uh, on that. So, again, I do want to highlight just the main takeaway from the wide receiver position is that we generally get it right. Fantasy football has become around to the wide receiver position, and this is why you're seeing more wide receivers go early on in drafts because it's becoming just such more of a relevant position both for NFL and for fantasy, and it's becoming easier to predict, unlike the running back room, which we're going to talk about next. We're going to see a lot of surprises with the running backs as we move on here. Well, I should hold my horses on that because Christian McCaffrey as a, as a running back one overall, yeah. I mean, he was the, one of the top three picks based on how you viewed Jamar Chase. He was either 102 or 103. Listen, Christian McCaffrey 
is on another planet when it comes to fantasy value or when it comes to even being a workhorse running back or just his talent combined with the Kyle Shanahan offense is unreal and it's just a cheat code for fantasy. Yeah, we all knew Christian McCaffrey was going to be this dude. It's why he went so early in drafts. But so many surprises coming later on in the drafts as we see a lot of the guys that were taken in the first round for uh, fantasy football are not here. And a lot of it has to do with injuries. Um, And we'll kind of wrap up what the injury impact means for the running back position at the end because it's unfair to say, well, Nick Chubb is a bust. Well, Saquon Barkley is a bust. These are guys that, you know, you can't predict injuries. We don't like to predict injuries. They're just part of the game that happens. Unfortunately, with the running back position, it just happens more often than not, which is another reason I think people are slowing their role on trying to draft running backs high, uh, high in drafts because when it comes to trying to capitalize on those, one injury could really, really devastate your fantasy team. But, you know, the next four guys... These are guys that were drafted round 11 or lower. And I mean, I only say that because of Devon A. Chain. A lot of people were high on him in the breakout. But, you know, Kyron Williams was an undrafted guy throughout most drafts. Raheem Mostert, I know some people were a little bit higher on him in my per- in my drafts. I got him around 12, round 13. Definitely a late round sleeper that I thought was going to be very, very relevant going forward. Especially while Devon Achen got acclimated to the NFL as a rookie and with Jeff Wilson uh, on the physically unable to play list, I thought he was going to be a, a great workhorse uh, in a dynamic offense. And that became true. So I don't know, just seeing with this past game against the Buffalo Bills, it could be an outlier to the standpoint that the Buffalo Bills were the first team to slow down the Miami offense all the, um, in the first four weeks of the season. But we also saw a ton more work go to Devon Achen. He outsnapped Raheem Mostert. He had more opportunities than Raheem Mostert. So this could be kind of that changing of the guard. Maybe happens a little bit earlier than we would have liked to see as Raheem Mostert managers. But Raheem Mostert's outlook for the rest of the season is going to be severely hampered with Devon A. Chain taking the lead role in that backfield, as well as Jeff Wilson coming off the physically unable to playlist sooner rather than later. Salvin Ahmed is also back in the building after he missed a couple weeks with injury. So I just think the opportunities that Raheem Mostert was experiencing through the first month, are he's not going to experience that ceiling that he had. Maybe tape your expectations with Raheem Mostert going forward. I expect him to drop down these rankings quite severely as we get into uh, our next check-in, which will be the half-season recap. But Devon A. Chain, the dude is talented. I mean, a lot of people are comparing him to CJ2K. And I can totally see why. I mean, he is a little bit undersized, a little bit slight of frame for a running back, but he's a guy that's really dynamic at the position, um, really runs with a speed that's kind of unheralded uh, in the current modern NFL. Some of these guys are more, you know, you look for speed, but you look for guys that have a good balance of speed with weight and size and power, uh, but they don't have this type of 4 3 rumored 4-2 speed that Devon A. Chain does, and you can really see it on the field when he breaks away from tackles. He doesn't break away in power. He breaks away because most of these guys are getting like two fingers, maybe a palm on him, and it's just not enough force. And he has enough, he has good enough contact balance to stay through through some of these slight attempts to tackle him. Um, but yeah, Devon A. Chain should be a very high running back throughout the rest of the season. And I expect the same thing out of Kyron Williams. This is not something, I mean, I'm going to take my victory lap on the Cam Akers drama here because he was a guy that I was very, very much out on coming into the draft season. A lot of people were saying, look at his workload through the last half of the season. But there are some very obvious red flags coming in with Cam Akers. Matthew Stafford was out. Cooper Cup was out. Aaron Donald was injured and out for the rest of the season. This was basically, you know, This was the replacements coming in to play for the Rams. They literally didn't care what happened. Sean McVay probably was already mentally checked out uh, and then just threw Cam Akers in there because, you know, he had to put a body in there at running back. And it was always stuck with me that there was something odd about the whole way the Cam Akers drama transpired between him and Sean McVay. And I said it was going to be, I would not be shocked if that drama popped up again. You know, it's not something that, you know, Listen, I know this is a wild analogy to make, but, you know, with your partner, your spouse or whatever, if you go through some drama, if they cheat on you or something, that hurt never goes away. It's always lingering in the back of your mind. You never fully, like, from a a fight of that magnitude, you never fully recover, and it's always lingering and can come up and, you know, show its ugly colors again. And that's exactly what happened in week two when he was a healthy scratch, and they thus... Uh, and then therefore traded Cam Akers. So Kyron Williams comes in, um, but we know once Sam Sean McVay 
falls in love with a running back, the utilization is off the charts. We saw this with Todd Gurley um, and with no one else impeding his lead back status with the Los Angeles Rams and with Matthew Stafford actually playing with a rejuvenated soul, spirit, and talent. Kyron Williams is, in my opinion, a top 10 back rest of season. He is a must roster kind of guy, must start week in and week out, matchup agnostic. I don't care how bad the matchup is. He's a guy that comes in, um, will get pass work, will get running work. He's uh, truly good. Kenneth Walker, you know, Definitely outperforming ADP thus far. A lot of people were worried about Sean, uh, Zach Charbonnet coming in and becoming this coming a committee. We saw on Monday night against the Giants, Charbonnet did get a little bit more work, but I think we can chalk that up to a lot of the game script. When they are competitive, Kenneth Walker is the guy. The dude is just too talented, and he has actually improved on some of the areas that we thought he wasn't going to improve on uh, in 2022. Things that we weren't totally enthralled with Kenneth Walker was his pass catching ability as well as efficiency at the goal line. Kenneth Walker has been much more efficient in the goal line. Maybe could use a little bit of work with the pass catching game. But overall, I don't see anything stopping him from being a top 10 running back rest of the season because, you know, in the Seattle Seahawks, Seahawks offense, they love their running backs. Pete Carroll loves to establish the run. And Kenneth Walker is the lead guy. The two B Robinsons, B. John Robinson, He's expected. This was really around his ADP. Drafted at the back half of the first round. And I mean, he is he's lived up to the billing. He has taken on the hype and has absolutely performed what you expected him to be. And I expect him to be a top 10 back going forward. He is just wildly talented. Pass catching running back, you know, with speed, with power, especially in an offense that really highlights the running back position. Bijan is that dude. And Brian Robinson. I know another guy that was a late round draft pick that's really accelerated his um, value for fantasy football. Um, Antonio Gibson, I mean, they got rid of not Jarek McKinnon, Jared, um, Jarek McKissick. That's the guy. <laughs> they let go of him. So you see a lot of the pat work, pass work, uh, pass catching work has been eliminated from, or his role has been eliminated from the offense. They tried to do that with Antonio Gibson, but Antonio Gibson looks like he's just basically done. He doesn't really look to be massively utilized in this offense he's been um, really on the fritz with the coaching staff his snap share has been wildly down compared to what brian robinson is going so when you look at a true workhorse running back especially in an offense that um, has outperformed expectations thus far this season brian robinson is a guy that um, as a sophomore running back has been very very productive for fantasy football let's try to pick this up i know i'm take lingering on the running back so we'll kind of do a quick hits throughout the rest of the top 20 and move on Tony Pollard, Dallas, you know, he was a second round running back. Um, truly, he's a talented guy, and I don't expect this to change. He should be a top 10 back going forward. Um, you know, those who took the risk on him at the end of the second round, stepping up into a larger workload. Um, great bet. It has certainly paid off. And I think Mike McCarthy is handling him the right way. My concern around Tony Pollard was that, you know, he's a guy that really relies on explosivity, um, relies on really athletic dynamic runs, but he can't be that true guy that comes in and plays 80% of snaps, but they have done a great job managing his snap share. Rico Dowdle has come in and been that change of pace back and they have kept Tony Pollard's snap share around 55 to the low 60%, which I think is his sweet spot for, you know, being able to produce those dynamic runs as well as, you know, getting enough rest. So he's not completely burnt out by the end of the game so I do have to credit Mike McCarthy on that David Montgomery a guy that we definitely highlighted on this channel as a sleeper in the seventh sixth seventh rounds that you should be picking up everywhere he was going to take over the Jamal Williams role and Jamal Williams was the RB7 on the season last year again an offense we really believed in under Ben Johnson and the Detroit Lions and he was going to have that touchdown upside Jameer Gibbs just did not profile as a guy that was going to get that in between the tackle workload and David Montgomery was going to have that touchdown upside. He was going to be that guy that goes out and is the every down back, the first, second down back, gets in between the tackle runs. And especially with behind a top five offensive line that they have in Detroit, I really love the upside that David Montgomery possesses. He's come out and been absolutely magical at the running back position, and he should be a guy that finishes around this RB10, RB12 spot going forward. Derrick Henry is Derrick Henry. It's been a little tough sledding going on. It's hard when uh, the passing game isn't up to snuff with the Tennessee Titans, but Derrick Henry is just, he is King Henry for a reason. Um, I mean, he's going to get it done. He is a unicorn amongst backs. He is, until we see a Braylon Allen or Raheem Sanders come in to kind of match the size and power profile that Derrick Henry has, he's truly a unicorn at tight end position. Trade for Derrick Henry if someone's low on him because... His playoff matchups, if you go week 14, uh, if your playoff matchups are 15, 16, 17, 
He plays the Texans in Week 15 and the Texans again in Week 17. He will be a fantasy winner. Trade low for Derrick Henry if you possibly can. I did skip over DeAndre Swift, a guy that's definitely outperformed what I expected um, from him coming into the season. I was kind of out on DeAndre Swift. I didn't know if he was going to be able to stay in the workload. I didn't know what that committee was going to look like in Philadelphia, but it really has streamlined itself into DeAndre Swift being the main back with Kenneth Gainwell being that a little bit more than a 1B. You know, he comes in, he has a good change of pace back, but it's not 1A, 1B. It's more like 1A and 1D. Um, and DeAndre Swift has been explosive. He's averaging nearly six yards per carry. Uh, actually, he's averaging 6.8 yards per carry. Compare that to Jalen Hurts, who's averaging 6.9 yards, 6.9 yards per pass. That is an unbelievable metric, but it shows just how much the Eagles do lean into this run game. And when they have shown that they're all in on DeAndre Swift, as long as he can stay healthy, knock on wood, he will be an amazing back going forward. So if you take that risk on him later on in the drafts, I mean, David Montgomery, DeAndre Swift's backfield was, you know, probably the best backfield for current ADP price uh, and return on investment um, so far. Isaiah Pacheco, a guy that I loved later on in drafts, uh, just, you know, comes in, runs like he hates the ground. He's a ferocious runner. He comes out uh, and he's really um, taken over that lead role in the Kansas City offense. I know we were all very trepidatious to invest in skill position players for the Chiefs outside of Travis Kelsey because they do love to spread the ball around. But Isaiah Pacheco has really elevated himself to that one guy that, you know, you can count on week in and week out and his workload will be consistent uh, and Clyde Edwards-Alaire and Jarek McKinnon have both been wildly inefficient when actually running the ball in between the tackles, so his workload is completely safe there. James Cook uh, outperformed my expectations, certainly, but you know, tied to one of the best offenses, and it seems like Damian Harris isn't coming in and taking any work. They're trying to actually slow down Josh Allen as far as a running back, so James Cook's uh, workload has upticked. I think this is actually a little bit slow for what he's, uh, his current value is. I would really look at James Cook as being a guy that falls into the 9-10 range because he hasn't found the end zone just yet. With We talked about that touchdown stat being a, not a very sticky stat. He should regress towards the mean. He should get some touchdowns, and I expect his value to jump way up. So if you want to buy the slight dip at the quarter season mark, I love that. James Conner, a guy I picked up in so many drafts um, all over the place just because, you know, he's a guy that the workload, the just the sheer volume – translated to elite production when we talk about and this could be a, a translated to a lot of these guys we're talking about I don't want to hit on it every single running back but with James Conner you know 20 opportunities per game is what you want to average to be an elite war, uh, running back he was averaging well over 25 opportunities per game as we got towards the end of the 2022 season and that was without Kyler in the offense um, even with how bad this offense projected to be coming into the 2023 season it's obviously gotten a little bit of an uptick with Josh Dobbs outperforming everyone's expectations but with just that sheer opportunity James Conner becomes an elite fantasy option and for the value you got him at you know 12 13 14 it's definitely I expect him to continue to produce for the rest of the season Jerome Ford, um, he's here because of the Nick Chubb injury. It's, it really sucks. It's tragic what happened to Nick Chubb. I'm just glad that he's okay. Typically with injuries like that, it could become even more severe um, if they do sever the nerve connection, connection or the artery in that leg. It becomes not uh, when he can come back to football, but whether or not they have to actually amputate the leg. So hearing that, you know, the injury, it looked horrible. I almost threw up watching it. I'll be a man and admit that. But just the fact that everything went okay with Nick Chubb, really, I am... Over the moon thrilled for Nick Chubb because he's a guy that just everyone likes. Not a single person doesn't like Nick Chubb, but Jerome Ford, you know, behind this offense with Kevin Stefanski that usually runs the ball, he has certainly benefited with Nick Chubb being out. But, you know, prayers up for Chubb and hopefully he can come back. Um, Zach Moss, you know, coming in takes the place of Jonathan Taylor. Uh, as long as Jonathan Taylor's out of the offense, I think Zach Moss is a guy that continues to produce RB2 value. Um, he's looked actually quite exceptional uh, so far this season. He's done. He's put up this RB16 performance with only three games and coming back from a broken hand. Um, I think he benefits with Anthony Richardson being more productive than we actually anticipated coming into this season. He was not as raw as we really projected coming into the draft uh, process. So, um, you know, with a dual threat running back quarterback, they do have to pay attention to him. They typically have a uh, strong safety or a linebacker play spy on the running back, which would open up the box for Zach Moss's runs, um, which we've seen. And he's been quite productive and has a nose for the end zone, which has definitely boosted his value. Um, just to round this out, Alexander Madison, wildly inefficient. He had one good game against the Los Angeles Chargers. Take out that outlier game. Uh, and with Cam Akers being traded for, especially an offense that, you know, this is a... Um, 
Minnesota team that's one and three. I don't know how much they are going to continue continue to be competitive for the rest of the season. They could start tanking. They could start making plans to move on from the Kirk Cousins and the quarterback situation. They brought in Cam Akers, should split carries. Alexander Madison is not going to be relevant for the rest of the season. Uh, Josh Jacobs, you know, it was a slow start, but week four against the Chargers really did, you know, boost confidence that he's going to come back to his 2022 levels. Obviously missing training camp, not being around for the team. It's indicative of all players that have held out in the past that they do have a slow start. And that's what we saw with Josh Jacobs. So if you're able to weather that storm, uh, brighter horizons are ahead for Josh Jacobs. Travis Etienne. I have confidence that, you know, it was a great first game. The Jacksonville Jaguars have struggled throughout the next couple games. It just seems that the offensive line isn't as, isn't gelling as much as it was towards the end of last season. Trevor Lawrence has played well, but they've just been on the wrong side of variance. He's had a couple bad decisions, which have led to interceptions, which have led them to putting them in negative game scripts. Travis Etienne, I think, you know, is fair as a um, is fair as an RB two candidate. I'm not seeing that RB um, one upside. Definitely a guy that. Not really returning on ADP, a little bit less of, you know, you're not getting as much value as the ADP that you drafted him as, but, you know, a solid RB2 candidate going forward. And Joe Mixon, this is why I was out on Joe Mixon going forward. I mean, we could look at the 2022 season and we saw that um, he was wildly inefficient. He was averaging over a season, I think it was like 2.1 yards per carry. And if you had removed that one crazy five touchdown games, he finished outside of the running back 30. He's like running back 34 on the season. It was just something that was, you know, I didn't think was, if you broke it down and removed the outliers, it wasn't something that translated to general fantasy success going forward. Also, we always love to follow the money. And he went from an $11.5 million contract and just to stay with the, um, Bengals, he took a $10 million pay cut. So now he's on a $1.5 million salary that can be cut next season. And he took that $10 million pay cut because I genuinely believe he didn't, he wasn't going to get anything close uh, to that nature of a contract with any other team, just given the nature of the running back market. So it just kind of shows the faith of the Bengals they have in Joe Mixon as an asset. And um, with Joe Burrow's calf injury and just how putrid this Bengals offense has looked overall. Joe Mixon is a guy that I'm really, I'm trying to move off of in Dynasty. You know, I'm selling him. Maybe you say, hey, he's an RB2 right now. But going forward, I expect the efficiency to stay the same, if not get worse. He was saved in week um, in week three by a very lenient touchdown that was in a very favorable situation for him. But overall, he would be like an RB30 without uh, that touchdown upside. That was just very luckily just gifted um, into his hands. So... Uh, and this is, again, high, you can call me hindsight bias, confirmation bias, whatever you want. But this is why we're becoming more and more adverse to drafting running backs um, early on. Because we have guys in the top 20 that are we're not even close to being picked in the first 10 rounds. Raheem Mostert, Devon A. Chain, Kyron Williams, Brian Robinson. Um, these guys were a little bit lower, but you certainly didn't expect them to be top 20 running back options coming into the season. Um, Isaiah Pacheco, James Cook, Jerome Ford, Zach Moss. Um, you know, that's almost half of these players that we're looking at that weren't drafted in the top 20. And we're seeing so many guys that were drafted in the top 20 fall out. And this, again, for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, the rise of the running back committee, the fact that this is a, and I'm not going to discount the players that are not here like a Chubb or Saquon because of lack of talent. It's because they're injured, but we have to do understand the way in the way we play fantasy we have to take logical risks and we understand that the running back position is a position that with just the current ferocity of the game generally gets injured more than other positions and you it's a very large risk taking some of these guys in the first and second round that have an increased risk and i mean sometimes you look at it i mean you play the game with aaron jones expecting him to miss two to three games per season some of these guys Saquon Barkley you were like okay cool I'm taking him here but I know he's going to be missing games at some point throughout the season and I asked kind of a wild way to play fantasy for me I'd rather take the shot on a wide receiver who could has a, has a higher chance to stay healthy throughout the um entirety of the season but then even still without some of the injuries that have been suffered I mean you look at these guys who just come in and produce um just because of the situation that they're in um so yeah so it kind of you know lets me give more confidence into picking up running backs off the waiver wire, streaming running backs, um, just keeping a good rotation of deeper players on my roster, reaching for some of those guys that, you know, 
might not be ta- as talented as a Saquon or a Nick Chubb, but James Cook is in a good situation. Pacheco's in a good situation. DeAndre Swift is in a great situation behind that Eagles offensive line. So reaching for those guys a little bit later on in drafts and really building up a core wide receiver and quarterback um, room early on. And I say quarterback as a wide receiver because that's where we're going – quarterback – as a core position, because that's where we're going next. And definitely a guy, uh, a position that I want to hint on that the fantasy community has just become so much more adept at judging quarterbacks um, in the past, especially in the past few years from, there's no way that you're going to go out. And I mean, in the past, you've been able to pick up a Lamar Jackson as a league winner in the ninth round, you pick up a Jalen Hurts in the sixth round. We're just getting much smarter as a fantasy community, evaluating running backs and their impact on fantasy, especially with the rise of a, uh, especially with the rise of the dual threat quarterback. And that's why even the rookie Anthony Richardson, a quarterback that generally would not would go undrafted maybe as early as three years ago, he was being taken um, as the ninth, 10th quarterback off the board. He came off the board above Deshaun Watson in some of my home leagues, or not even home leagues, but just some of my leagues because of the true upside of the dual threat running quarterback. And, you know, he's paid off. I mean, yes, he missed... He missed one game. It severely impacted his performance, but he just comes off of a 30-point uh, performing week against the Los Angeles Rams. This dude is going to be a top 10 quarterback rest of season. But, I mean, you look at these guys that have been drafted in the top six quarterbacks. You know, all these guys went in the top five rounds. We're looking at Justin Herbert, uh, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts, Patrick Mahomes, um, the rise of a quarterback being taken high just because of the immense value they provide. And, you know, they have been truly exceptional when it comes. I mean, because the standard has been raised when it comes to the quarterback. No longer is a 20 point game good enough at the quarterback position. You're looking for these guys like an Anthony Richardson who can come out and deliver you that 30 point week because they have that rushing ability. You're looking for a Justin Herbert with the boost of the Kellen Moore offense to, you know, increase that downfield um, ability to pass. And, you know, the standard for him. 26 point week with 300 yards passing and three touchdowns. Lamar Jackson, his rushing ability, you know, 18 points, you're disappointed. You want that 25 to 28 point week when he scampers into the end zone. Um, Josh Allen comes off of a massive 38 point week um, against the Miami Dolphins. You know, these, this is the new expectation that we have set for quarterbacks and why investing in one early is becoming a strategy that I am increasingly more likely to adopt. Um, Jordan Love, again, I love Jordan Love. I think he's in a great situation. I do think he finishes as a top 10 quarterback just because the situation around him is so good. He's in the NFC North. That is a putrid, has just every worst defense in the NFL. You have the Vikings uh, and you have the Chicago Bears that he still has yet to play uh, two times. And I mean, the Detroit Lions are a good defense, but overall the NFC is a weak conference and he's just supported by so many good pass catchers and skill position players. We have Aaron Jones. We have Romeo Dobbs. We have Christian Watson. Jaden Reed has looked great as a rookie. Uh, And Luke Musgrave has really emerged as a tight end. So, you know, he has one of the better, this is, um, a skill position player room last year that we were talking about one of the worst in the NFL. And despite its incredible youth, it's become very um, beneficial for Jordan Love to use that as a springboard platform. You know, his PFF grade is horrible because he does screen passes. He uses short slant passes. He just, he, he's not challenged as a quarterback to make these crazy throws, but he, he's, Utilizing Matt LaFleur is utilizing the immense talent of these skill position players to capitalize on what Jordan Love can do. And hey, if it's a screen pass to go for 50 yards or if he airs it out for 50 yards for a great contested catch, it all counts the same for Jordan Love. It does not matter. So the position that he's in, he's not going to finish as a a quarterback three. You know, he's been on the positive side of variance. He's had a couple of interceptions dropped. Um, He's had a couple of mistakes. He's been on the good side of, you know, screen passes for touchdowns. It's going to regress a little bit, but he's definitely a guy that, you know, should produce for fantasy and be a low end, like probably ends up around the wide receiver or quarterback eight, quarterback nine area when it comes, uh, when all is said and done to, uh, um, one of the guys that I, if I couldn't get an Allen or a Hertz at the top of the draft, Tua was my main target because I I just believed I don't bet on I don't bet on injuries I know it's something we have to account for but I don't like to say hey listen I'm gonna I'm just I'm writing off Tua because of the concussion thing he's back he's tied to one of the most dynamic offenses in the history of the NFL Mike McDaniel's is becoming a legend as an offensive coordinator this offense is just remarkable for what it puts on the field for the speed and I think you know. The same way we talk about Jared Goff, the same way we talk about um, Kirk Cousins, just when you're put in great situations, when you're helming one of the more explosive offenses in the NFL, 
as the quarterback, as the person touching the ball every single play, you're going to benefit from that. And that's what we see with Tua. And he's put up some really amazing weeks. And it's funny because even like in a 70 point game, he puts up 28 points, which was good enough for quarterback three on the week, but you're still disappointed. Um, you're like, damn, 70 points, and I only got 28 from my quarterback? What are you doing? Uh, but, yeah, I mean, he should be a great quarterback, top five quarterback, as long as he can stay healthy, knock on wood for him. Um, and, yeah, C.J. Stroud, I do want to touch on him as, you know, there's always those rookie bets that we want to bet on coming into the season. The main bet was on Anthony Richardson, but C.J. Stroud with just, you know, how good that offense has looked. It's been a bad offensive line, but I think it's going to come around with Houston Texans. Laramie Tunsil will come back at some point. He'll get a little bit more protection, but even without the protection, it's really forced him to throw the ball. Like we said, he is, you know, a top, he is one of the top uh, quarterbacks in terms of pure passing yardage. And that's been immense for C.J. Stroud developing fantasy value because he gets points for all those yardage. Um, And, you know, his adjustment to the NFL has been a lot better than what a lot of people predicted coming into the NFL season. Um, and I think that he is going to be, you know, that quarterback 10 to 11 for the rest of the season. I don't, this is an offense in Houston Texans that projects to be in a lot of negative game scripts. The defense is not what we really expect as tremendous. Um, so he'll have to pass a lot. He'll, have, he'll be relied on to really facilitate an offense. And, you know, a guy that a sleeper pick right now that if you went in on Justin Fields, if you have, um, Trevor Lawrence, Geno Smith. Um, I think I'm probably benching them for CJ Stroud, matchup dependent going forward. Uh, but yeah, not again. So when we talk about wide receivers, the fantasy community as a whole is coming into their own as uh, quarterback evaluators. And this is why quarterbacks are going higher and higher in drafts because we know the value of the true dual threat quarterbacks, the ones that are really elite for fantasy. Um, and they pay off. They pay off in dividends. Um, and, you know, something that going forward, I'll be targeting quarterbacks higher and higher in drafts. Um, Moving on to the last position, which is the tight ends, which I really, I really don't want to talk about tight ends because even in, you know, four games, the sample size in which we can really evaluate wide receivers, quarterbacks and running backs because their volume is just that immense through week three. And we talked about this last week, Pharaoh Brown, and I, I made a mistake. I said he had one catch. He actually had two catches. My apologies. He had two catches through three games, and based on your format of the, based on the format of your respective leagues, he was either the wide, he was the tight end thirteen all the way to the tight end eighteen, on two catches. That is ludicrous. It's just how devalued this position is. It's hard to extrapolate any sort of trends or data with this small of a sample size. I mean, you look at the total yards in comparison to a running back in comparison to a wide receiver. Um, They're just really not utilized. And at this point, if you are feeling the effect of a Dallas Goddard, of a Darren Waller, of a George Kittle, these guys that are all down here um, towards the bottom, that's fine. Go get a Hayden Hurst. Go get a Dalton Schultz. Just put a body in there. It doesn't really matter. If you're getting eight points from your tight end position, you're going to have like the tight end six or seven on the week. It does not matter. I am... I understand the value of a Mark Andrews. He just came off of a massive 22-point week. I understand the point of a Travis Kelsey. He can go and blow up for multiple touchdown games. But it's just the tight end position. And as we get into these leagues that are more, you know, larger and larger, people want to add flex positions. Three wide receiver starts are coming more and more common. Super flex is coming more and more common. And you look at, you know, the traditional leagues that had one quarterback, two running backs, two tight ends. Or sorry. One quarterback, two running backs, two wide receivers, a tight end and a flex uh, on top of a kicker and defense. That's one-ninth of a starting position. You're starting nine, and that's one-ninth of the points. And I get it. There's value in having 11 point whatever um, percentage of your points coming from TJ Hawkinson. Sorry, or TJ Hawkinson or Mark Andrews or Travis Kelsey, these guys that are at the top. But as these league formats expand, when you start 11, the start even to start 10, but you're getting more, um, more popular – start 11, start 12s if you want to start kickers and defenses as well. Even with, you know, IDP leagues becoming more popular, those become like start 16 or start 17s. The value of the tight end position becomes less than 10% of your overall points each and every week. And it's just not something that, you know, you're never going to flex a tight end. You're never going to, you know, use it outside of that one position. And I even seen more and more people adopt, you know, the tight end wide receiver flex instead of a pure tight end position. It's just a, a position in fantasy football that is becoming less and less relevant as the years go on. Maybe there's a bounce back with, you know, 
the NFL putting an emphasis on a Sam Laporta, who's a truly a pass catcher, a pass catching tight end, with a Dalton Kincaid coming out as a guy that you know is a slot wide receiver more than a tight end position, with T.J. Hawkinson and Travis Kelsey and Mark Andrews really revolutionizing or pioneering that type of position. But overall, you can punt the position. You can get some of these guys at the end of drafts. Evan Ingram was a guy that fell to the eighth round. Um, Hunter Henry was a guy that was you know at the end of the rounds. Dalton Schultz, Hunter. Dalton Schultz, Hayden Hurst are guys that, you know, put up decent weeks, weeks in and weeks out. Zach Ertz, undrafted guy, his current tight end 12. Um, you, you can stream his position so easily that I think there's more value to be acquired at the top of drafts from any of the other positions. Um, but overall, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, Travis Kelsey, you know, he missed one game. Totally fine. Mark Andrews also missed one game. They'll skyrocket up. They'll finish in the top three as they always do. Um, but I think their impact on the overall points distribution is going to be less than what we are typically expecting to expecting from Mark Andrews and Travis Kelsey. TJ Hawkinson has had, you know, a very has been an, a breakout player for the Minnesota Vikings, very heavily utilized as this offense is entirely pass based. They're so inefficient running the ball with Madison and Cam Akers, and they're in such the defense is so bad that they're in, you know, very positive game scripts for the passing offense that TJ Hawkinson is just getting an immense amount of targets and looks. As you can see, he has the most targets at the tight end position um, through week four. So that's sheer volume should keep him relevant. Sam Laporta as a rookie tight end. Um, very excited for what he can produce for the rest of the season. If you're able to pick him up off waivers, congratulations. You have a great tight end that I'll be playing over anyone but TJ Hawkinson, Mark Andrews, and Travis Kelsey at this point. Um, even with Jamison Williams returned to the offense, I don't think it's going to impact his... Um, you know, it's going to not going to impact his utilization because, you know, where Jameson Williams threatens down the far end of the field and where Sam Laporte is being used in the short to intermediate routes, they don't over, they don't intersect at all. They don't overlap. He'll be just fine. Hunter Henry has been a great standout. Um, I do have concerns about the Patriots offense as a whole, but you know, when they're not playing defenses like the Dallas Cowboys, Hunter Henry should be involved. And you know, is a, is a, a great guy that is going to be a body you can throw into the tight end position. And Evan Ingram um, is old, reliable. Jake Ferguson gets a boost from two really good games in the past uh, couple weeks. But I think, you know, we've seen involvement in Luke Schoonmaker. He's going to come in. I think, um, when you get into more competitive games and less blowouts, you're going to be relying on Brandon Cooks and C.D. Lamb more often than you know your tight ends and Jake Ferguson and Luke Schoonmaker. So I'm not sold on the Ferguson hype for the rest of the season. But overall, um, tight ends are tight ends. You have your top three in TJ, Kelsey, and Andrews. Laporta, great breakout as a rookie. Kyle Pitts um, and Arthur Smith threw him to the dogs. It's truly tragic our only hope is that next year they bring in a different head coach who values the run, values the past game and they draft a competent quarterback like drake may bo nix michael Penix. my money uh my favorite quarterback is michael Penix. um really really high on him would love to see him go to atlanta um he's gonna be my sleeper all of next year that's a little shout out for michael Penix. but overall tight ends they're just bodies to throw in i'm very ugh. As you can tell with my attitude, I could not be bothered. Um, but let's wrap it up. You know, we've talked about how, you know, some of these trends that are going to continue, why we, you know, hindsight being 2020, I'm using this as confirmation bias as to why we really invested in wide receivers early on in drafts. And I think it's paid out in dividends for the players that invested in um, their uh, set of running backs, Sands, Christian McCaffrey. But going forward, I think there are some things to pay attention to. There's a lot of, players that were very devalued in drafts based on the status of their team, but they managed to come into the top 20 position or top 20 or top 10 based on the positions that we covered here. Look at Houston Texans players. We saw both Nico Collins and Tank Dell in the top 20. We saw Damian Pierce. He was in the top 20 and I don't think that's going to change something for the running back position that I think we should notice is that we did not see Miles Sanders nor Damian Pierce in the top 20. And those are guys that were drafted in round four, round five of each respective draft, just based on their talent alone. But historically, we have to look at, you know, trends of fantasy football. And in offenses helmed by rookie quarterbacks, generally the running backs in those respective offenses don't produce. And that is what we have seen so far. It confirms that historical trend. Rookie quarterbacks don't get the um, running backs involved. They don't really 
engage uh, in the pass catching work for the running back that we're used to. It takes time for them to develop to the NFL game. They generally hold on to the ball more. They don't make those quick decisions. We've seen the time of um, time to pass for Bryce Young has been, I think, double what his time was when he was at Alabama as he adjusts to this NFL play speed. Um, so, and, you know, generally having a rookie quarterback in there that doesn't know how to work pocket movement that is adjusting to, you know, NFL pass rushes, it doesn't do any favors for the offensive lines. And with the degrading the offensive line through that quarterback play, um, it definitely, you know, we've seen both of the, Call it Carolina offensive line and the Houston offensive line be bottom 10 uh, in the NFL. And that's obviously going to negatively impact the running back position. So again, something to look forward to um, quarterbacks, uh, rookie quarterbacks with off um, offenses held by rookie quarterbacks. We do need to be more trepidatious of those running backs going forward. However, outside of that, you know, a lot of the players um, talked about Nico Collins and tank Dell. We talked, we're going to talk about, Puka Nakua and Tutu Atwell, also the Arizona players, and James Conner and uh, Marquise Brown and even Michael Wilson. These are guys that were severely undervalued in drafts solely due to the preconceived notions about their teams. And I might and I might do a video about you know preconceived notions as a whole and how do we adjust those preconceived notions coming into the draft because we need to not let this biases impact us in terms of player talent. These are guys that have severely outproduced their ADP and we knew they were going to be talented. They've been talented in the past. Maybe not the rookies in Puka and Tutu, but you know Connor has been talented. Marquise Brown has been talented, and we need to bet on these talents um, to continue to keep producing because they are NFL caliber players and know how to play in the NFL game. And speaking of preconceived notions, very little Bengals players, very little Bengals players have really appeared on these lists. The only one that really made an appearance was Joe Mixon at running back 19, just barely ekes into the top 20 running backs. This is a Bengals team that, honestly, you can look at it the way it stands right now. It might be done for the season. That calf injury with Joe Burrow does not look to be getting any better. He is very immobile in the pocket. It's really impacting because it's his plant leg. It's his leg that he you know drops that three-step drop plant throw. Um, he does not have that power, and it's showing in both his arm strength. Um, he doesn't have the same zip on the ball that he's had previously. He doesn't have the same accuracy that he's had on the ball previously, and his total, you know, Total air yards are significantly down from 2022. So I think with how impactful Joe Burrow has been to that offense, you know, he wasn't in the top 10 quarterbacks, no shocker there. Um, I'm really, really out on Bengals players for the rest of the season because uh, it's really going to be at the mercy of this injury. That is an injury that normally takes five weeks of total rest to recover from, especially after he re-aggravated it in week three. Or, or week two, uh, whichever one it was, he re-aggravated it. And unless they're going to sit Joe Burrow whether Joe Burrow plays through it or whether they set him for five weeks at the end of that period, when we talk about this again in, you know, five in week nine, week 10, it's going to be a team that's out of playoff contention. That's really not relevant um, in the NFL scheme. And they're going to probably just shut down and try to focus uh, for 2024. And it's just, it's very sad for a team that was so hyped coming into this off season, you know, Jamar chase, the one two overall basically consensus in that regard. Uh, T Higgins was a third round pick. Joe Mixon was a fourth round pick. Joe Burrow was a fourth, a fifth round pick. And it's been very, very disappointing for the Bengals players. So we have to adjust our preconceived notions and understand that the Bengals that are playing now are not the Bengals of the past two years. They are severely hampered by injury and by a wildly inefficient passing game. And we've seen that before Joe Burrow broke out, this was a team that was a bottom feeder team because they really rely on Joe Burrow's ability to get the ball downfield to create an incredible passing attack with both T. Higgins and Jamar Chase. And that's just not something that's been, that's not, that has not materialized throughout this season. So I'm going to end it there. This video has gone on long enough. So if I've missed any headlines, you know, we got, we got 12 more weeks to talk about them. Got plenty of videos left to talk about them. Um, but this was just mostly a video to recap the top positions uh, or the top players at each position through four weeks, our quarter season recap. Hopefully you have gleaned some sort of insight into this gives you some opportunities to target players going forward for the rest of the season, or maybe some players to avoid for the rest of the season, or maybe giving you some confidence and players that will bounce back. Um, but yeah, 
we'll talk about that. And then obviously I do apologize. I did make a mistake. I only uploaded my shorts to TikTok this week. I totally spaced and forgot to upload the shorts to YouTube apart from the Romeo Dobbs one. So I apologize. I'll be better about that. Shorts will be back uh, on the channel later this week for my start set decisions uh, for week five, which is going to be crucial because now we have buys to play with and we have to reach a little bit deeper on our bench. And we're missing a lot of crucial teams like the Chargers who have been so fantasy relevant so far. So that being said, I hope you guys have enjoyed this quarter season recap. I will definitely see you for the shorts this week here on YouTube. And also go follow me on TikTok at Twin Takes FF. Definitely uh, better. This better platform for shorts over there. Um, but, you know, hopefully you guys are staying true. Don't give up on your teams just yet. There's always time for bounce backs. Um, and, you know, good luck to your teams in week five. And I'll see you next week. Take care.